conversation and a little bit of a feature regarding her most recent book, Freedom is an Inside Job, Owning Our Darkness and Our Light to Heal Ourselves in the World. With that, I'd like to have Zainab join us. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. It's such a pleasure to have you, Zainab. The pleasure is all mine. Now, with our LinkedIn speaker series, we often engage in a common tradition to people we welcome to LinkedIn by having them share a little bit about themselves that's not on their LinkedIn profile. All right. So what have you got? <laughs> well, do you, hear, do you hear me? Can you hear me? Am I not hearing myself? Yes? My scarf. Is this better? All right. OK. Um, hi, everyone. So here's some exposures of myself. The first picture, actually, is what people don't know how to, uh, that I do. I'm called the uh, Salads Queen by my friends uh, because I go camping once a year with an indigenous tribe uh, in Canada. And we go to teepee camp where there is ro no running water, no electricity, no cell phones. <laughs> Amazing, no news, no nothing actually. And we literally take the water from the lake, we warm it, we boil it, we cook, and there's no, I mean, and salads is the best thing to do. And this is my favorite time of the year. Um, I learned a lot from being with the Nishnabi tribe. Um, things that I, it's not only curiosity about indigenous culture, it's actually really a lot about how to honor earth and how to honor water and how to honor basic things in our life and I also learned that if you don't check your cell phone for 10 days actually not much things happen in the world that you can not check your cell phone for 10 days and so the first time I was anxious like oh my god and then the second time I've been doing that for almost 17 years now I really can easily you know check it off and it never, nothing happened like in 17 years that I missed out on, thank God, you know, but here life goes on. So I give that gift to myself and it is my, um, um, the time for my soul, you know, just to connect back to earth with nothing to distract me from that. So that was my, this is an anchoring for me. It's my pilgrimage, I call it. Um, now the next picture is I love animals and I don't have a pet no ca no cats no dogs or no nothing like that but I actually love connecting with different animals and I'm privileged to be able to go to many safaris in the world and I've worked in Rwanda for many many years and Rwanda have um, a unique experience to visit gorillas so this is three years ago I am crying in this picture because I was this far away from the gorilla. I mean, it was unbelievable and it was eating celery and I can cry now just talking about it and I'm smelling the celery, which I also like. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, they are just like us. How similar to us they are, it's unbelievable. And it's so arrogant of us to think that we are superior and that we're doing all this damage to Earth and to all the other animals in it without much consciousness. They are so, so similar in their dynamics, mother, child, parent. On the sexual side, they're also very much like us. <laughs> Unbelievable. Like I've seen all kinds, I was like, oh my God. They cheat on each other. They do all kinds of things. You know, it's like unbelievable, right? So that, I was just crying <laughs> because I was so deeply touched by the, the encounter. So um, then there is the next picture. Now, as you know, when I was told I can get hair and makeup, I always tell people there is no hair. I shave my hair. It's number three, um, which is a buzz number three for maybe men will know that, you know. And I go to a barber in every country or city that I go in. This way is so easy because I look exactly the same day and night and in every country. Um, and it gets me to talk with a lot of barbers. Sometimes I get rejected, they shoo me out, it depends on the country. No, like, no, only men. And I insist that I go in and I create the most amazing conversations. This is in Rwanda. Um, actually, in, in Rwanda, they were okay with me. It's like, it's just also weird that I'm not an African woman and getting a, a cut. But it creates all these conversations. I was in Turkey a few months ago and the guy's drinking tea, stopping and drinking coffee, offering me tea and then on the cell phone and shaving my head, like all kinds of adventures that I like. And it costs 20, it 
cost like this was three dollars haircut um, in America, in New York, it costs twenty-five dollars. In some cities, it costs. Like, so I like it. It's it's like a, it's it's my adventures around the world. And then when I'm not working, and I used to like, I am a workaholic. I was a workaholic, and it's hard to. And the next picture talks about what I'm getting at, and it's really hard for me to like give some time for myself. Now I can give the 10 days in, uh, in Canada for myself, but to really give daily uh, time for myself is something that I recently developed. And so the next picture shows um, a few hobbies that I took Beautiful. on. This is pottery um, that I started doing a few years ago. This is actually pottery in Turkey. The things about having hobbies is that you go every country you go to, you discover where, what are they doing and how they do it. And it sort of gives me this different entry points to different cultures other than the intellectual or the food or the tourist sites. It gives me a different entry point. So that I do, but also the fact that I allow myself on a weekly basis to go to my pottery class, for example, it sort of gives me this like meditation. And I came to realize that meditation is not only sitting and thinking about anything. Meditation is any activity we do that takes our mind off our daily reality. So be it pottery, be it race cars, be, or whatever it is, it's all meditation is the ability to give your brain some silence and I'm very competitive so when I do pottery usually there's a person next to me and I'm constantly looking if I can get my pot <laughs> taller than theirs you know you know, you know, you know. <laughs> so um, that's one of it that's in um, in Cappadocia actually um, and then I recently then following picture talks about a recent thing this is in my apartment here in the city my electric piano which is so cool I grew up um, playing piano when I was a kid, and I have not touched it for the last 10 years. And um, recently, I was very sick. Uh, I had Lyme's disease and was very in a scary condition. And when I opened my eyes and got better, I started noticing all the beauty that we humans create. I mean, like there's so much negativities these days in the world about all the things we do to hurt each other and to hurt Earth and to hurt every... But, yeah, and which is true, but also there's so much beauty we have. And when I was in the hospital room, and like, I listened to music, and I was like, wow, this is so beautiful. And so I actually start taking, re revisiting piano after 30 years of not playing it. And I'm so happy I like decided to play a piece, to learn a piece once uh, um, every month. Uh, I mean, write a, read a book once a month, but also play a piece once a month. I mean, one piece a month. And it's obsessive, and I like have to master it all the time. And it's really, again, it's another form of meditation. So I actually play piano right now one hour a day, and I would like drop seeing friends. I was like, no, I'm sorry, I have to go to my piano. Like, I have to practice, like, you, you know. It becomes, it's sort of the rituals, what I came to learn rituals in which we revisit time for ourselves, for myself, I need that. It's sort of that gift for me that I go back to my soul. And so whether it is piano or pottery or being with animals, or frankly at the barber because it makes me feel better about my looks, you know, it's, uh, these are rituals that I have, um, that are very important to keep me who I am. Thank you so much for sharing what's not on your LinkedIn profile, the beauty of which is, it's such a connection to who you are in the ways in which you connect with the world. And it's fascinating to hear your story as a humanitarian and certainly as a, a women's rights activist, but more so as a human being. And we talked a little bit about the power of being a human being. And I'd like to start a little bit of uh, the questioning and discussion that we have with something that I read in your book that I thought was really powerful because it was also a source of something that, that we have been discussing which is this ability to see the world and to see the externalities, to see people, but something that is so provocative in your words in seeing ourselves. And it begins with a passage that I read because you grabbed me from the beginning. Only when I began to see that other within myself could I truly see the other in them. 
in the rednecks of America, the Arabs of France, the fundamentalists of Islam, and in all of us. You reach for the other, it strikes me. And in some of the photos that you have and images, could you share a little bit about what led you to this journey of the other and who the other really is? Well, first of all, I want to go back to when you said the humanitarian, because a lot, the persona that you see on LinkedIn or in public is, is one persona. And I, th I don't think it's only me. I think with all of us, right? And it sort of deprives us of other, the multiplicity in our identities, you know, that I actually think fluidity is not only on gender, is in identities, you know. And so I like for the longest time, people, when they gave me gifts, they only gave me gifts of uh, books of human rights and women's rights books. I was like, I actually like reading romantic novels as well. <laughs> like, please stop giving me women's rights books because I am already doing it on my own, you oh, know, reading them, that. you know. So like we, you know, we sort of deprive the fact that you could be fun and like dancing and like, you know, silly things. The and, lightness you know, of life. Makeup and all of that, right? So we, we sort of, that's the other way that we otherize the other. But as someone, I have always been the other in my life. I grew up in, um, in Iraq, uh, in Baghdad, and was not, um, I was the other in my own country, as in my family were very close to Saddam Hussein, the dictator. And they were afraid we were one of his inner circles of social friends, not political friends, a friendship that we did not choose. And one to reject was actually dangerous. And so the whole society, I mean, I grew up in a family that we were on the front page of our national newspaper. And everyone feared us because we were close to the dictator who everyone feared. We feared him because he kills his best friends and his family members and we feared the people because they feared us as well and they thought we were one of him but we were not one of him so you know my memoir is called between two worlds because i neither fit here nor uh, fit there and it's sort of i was the other and you sort of as the other you sort of become uh, you build a wall around you we i think we all build a wall around us and at one point i realized um I am as afraid of them as they are of me. And in order to break that barrier, I'm going to have to take a leap of faith and lower the wall of protection that I have of, you know, in order for to, to show them that I'm not scary. <laughs> but the leap of faith, in my opinion, did not only entail me lowering my wall, it actually entailed the others who feared in this case, me, but I hope this applies to everyone, and especially in this moment in American history, in my opinion, or in the world history, the other also, they also had to lower their, their walls of projection in order to also see me. Do, do you see what I mean? So the leap of faith in seeing and communicating and understanding and seeing each other is not one party's action is both sides have to take an action in order to do that. But you cannot um, wait until the other side takes action. You have to sort of do it for yourself and in hope that they will reciprocate, but also without attachment to their ability to reciprocate. So do it for yourself to free yourself and not be attached to outcomes. Your eloquent voice in your book speaks to that context of otherness and that revelation that we are the other. We, each of us as individuals, and it's such a central concept to diversity, inclusion, and belonging. That ability to claim oneself with the self-awareness of who we are and to be, in fact, vulnerable. Um, to recognize that that other isn't necessarily the threat, but that other is another human being. Your journey is a powerful journey in that it began with you as a storyteller. Could you share with us a little bit about that moment when your storytelling gave way to telling your own story? Because you were the voice for so many right. for so long. Right. Thank you. Well, and it also got me, that same story got me to see the other in me. So I just told you about how I grew up. Then I came to America at the age of 20 in a most unforeseen circumstances on the eve of the Iraq war. It's, I'll spare you the story. Um, but I, at the age of 23, I um, 
started uh, Women for Women International and became a champion to help women survivors of wars um, to rebuild their lives. I did not know that it was also an expression of myself because I grew up in war and at a very young age I realized the world is talking about war only from a man's perspective, fighting and all of that, but I was seeing war also from a woman's perspective that they kept life going. So long story short, I create Women for Women International to reach out to women in other countries and help them rebuild their lives, claim their voice after war destroys it. And to do that, I would go to these countries, I hear women's stories, and then I come here and I would tell you the stories, and then I would tell you, hey, you can sponsor a woman for $30 a month, and a letter and a picture with her, and I raise money this way, and then this way we help other women. That's how it worked, right? It still works like that, actually. Um, and so the organization moved from a mom and pop to now helping, as Veronica said, hundreds of thousands of women around the world. And at one point, 15 years later, I am in Congo. I'm meeting a woman who is illiterate, um, homeless, um, 52 years old, and she only had a one dress, on, like the dress she wore is the only dress she owned. And she was telling me how she was violated and her nine-year-old and 21-year-old and 22-year-old daughters were raped and how her sons, I mean, it, it was a horrible story. They were pillaged and their homes were burnt, everything. And she looked at, and by the way, when I hear these stories, and that was, that is my expertise, you don't stop, um, the emotions, you know, like my heart always uh, would beat fast as I'm hearing the story. So in this case, she looks at me and she said, I never told anybody but you this story. Um, you are the first person I break it to. And I said, well, should I keep it a secret? You know, because I'm a storyteller. This is how it works. I go and tell the stories, I raise money so I can bring it, but it's not gonna be to you, it's gonna be to other women. I always tell the truth um, for many reasons. A, it's easier to tell the truth. Second, don't play with people's hope when you're not telling the truth. Oh, I'll come and get you all the things. And, and the third is my motto in life is to live the truth. So it's easier to tell it. So I was telling her, it's like, that's how it's gonna work. Do you want me to keep it a secret? And she looks at me. Now remember the dynamics. An illiterate woman with an educated one uh, has, has, don't have, all of the dynamics of, you know, that we're dealing with. And she looks at me and she said, if I can tell the whole world my story, I would. So other women would not have to go through what they have gone through. But I can tell the world, you can, you go ahead and tell the story, just not to the neighbors. Hmm. Now, <laughs> I had to drive for five hours afterwards and I was ashamed of myself in that moment and the moment and the hours afterwards because she had more courage in understanding the connection between her individual story and the collective story. And I am the educated New York uh, woman, you know, with my self-righteous confidence had, uh, was hiding behind the poor woman's stories. You know, I don't have a story, she has a story, you know. And I was embarrassed of myself that often I gave speeches and claimed values that I actually was so um, infatuated with them that I was not walking my own talk. I would ask people to do what I'm not even able to do it or question myself, can I break my own story? And you can take it whatever example that we are preaching in the world, but we are not living that value. And it reached a point and it's like, either I actually end up doing what she's doing and tell my story and not judge my story because I thought I don't have a story. And I thought my story is trivial. So either I say what sh I'm asking her to do and she's telling me sh I should do, or I walk out because I am no longer in integrity to myself, she doesn't know my story. And, and, and I, think, I think of that moment often, and I actually have since then really tried my best to align myself with my values every single day, not only moments, every single day. And so as a result, I end up deciding that I have to tell the whole world my story too. Now in her case, 
We told, I told her story. We got on the Oprah Winfrey show. We actually ended up raising $5 million to women survivors of wars because of this one woman. And as a result, I ended up telling my own story and wrote it in my memoir. And it's scary. It's scary when we tell a story. It's scary when we reveal our vulnerability because we are so scared of people's judgments. And we're so scared, are we, uh, are, is it going to hurt us? Uh, walls are easier. Our armor, is, is e we think it's easier, but actually it sort of suffocates us from within. And so when I told the story, when you tell the story, it's like a leap of faith. Yeah. And what I learned is all the fears that I had if, of breaking out my story and telling the world I knew Saddam Hussein and I was abused and I was in an arranged marriage and I was raped and I, all of the things that I was shamed, full of shame of it. First of all, I learned that actually I was the fear. I was the prison guard to my prison. You know, I was the prisoner and the prison guard. Second, what I feared people would act and do and all of that did not happen. Right. Um, third, in showing vulnerability and working on it constructively. I mean, we talked about, I always say, when you share vulnerability, it doesn't mean you're sharing your weakness and you want to be saved. It means that you're constructively working on yourself, sharing a vulnerability from a point of strength, not from a point of weakness, so you can open the door for others also to be in conversations and also share their vulnerability. And that's when we go into authentic connection, which we need desperately in the world. And so when I did the story, it created so, it opened a whole world of, of other connections with me, of women and men were saying, this is not only your story, it's our story, it's our collective story. And it led to a liberation from the prison I was living in. There's such richness in all that you've described. For so many of us, the narrative is about not letting people know our real stories because they will judge us. And this concept of vulnerability is weakness and how it's so much easier to talk about others than it is to share who we really are and perhaps what we've experienced or even the idea that we have a story to tell and a voice to give rise to. And what I find so profound in what you shared and hearing it from you live, it's as powerful as when I, I first read about it, is this idea that even in our, our moments of being leaders, the biggest breakthrough we have is that breakthrough to being vulnerable, not as weakness, but as an act of responsibility for who we are and as an act of responsibility for being, no being known and lending to this context of, of our connections in the world. As you've traveled this journey, could you share a little bit about this idea of the authenticity, the authenticity that became presented not only in that conversation with the woman from the Congo, but authenticity in your own journey, because so much of our life is often based on what we're told. And what was fascinating in your story was also the things we have to untell ourselves, the new stories we have to reveal in order to create space, not only for our greatness, but the greatness of others who surround us. And I think that's so much the power of belonging. And you've, you've lived it in, in such, such a dynamic way. Well, I evolved into it. So I started my career as an activist and as a women's rights activist. And I charged, you know, uh, with anger. I, and I built a, a, a major women's organization, raised $120 million. And if you ask me how, what was the emotion that helped you build that, I said, it, it's anger. You know, it's anger at injustice. It's anger at all the wrongs that women are going. And that yet, that anger at one point was going to consume me and take me in the fire itself. In other words, so I realized, I, and I caught myself in that moment of saying, oh my God, if I continue to lead with anger, I risk, we risk becoming what we are fighting against. If we con anger is a constructive emotion to spark the fire, to say there is wrong and there is right. And in my case, I really believe that when we invariably avoid acknowledging or hearing about injustice, we legitimize it and we allow for the corruption of our own values. 
So anger in this case is a constructive emotion that sparks the light. However, and I say this for this moment in time, in our time, that if we continue to lead with anger, then it can, the fire can consumes us and we become the divisive force. We become the angry force that scares the others, right? So for me, that's how it sort of started, is catching myself at this. And as a feminist, it started actually, honestly, in a moment in Afghanistan where I, there was two guys who looked like the Taliban and I was scared of them. And I was like, oh my God, they are the Taliban, they're gonna kill me because I thought all Afghan men are the Taliban and all of them are oppressive and all of them are. And then they came to me and these guys and they spread their arms to me and they said, we wanna thank you for making our wives smile. We have not been able to see them smile for a long time. And I was again catching myself in an embarrassed moment that I had judged them in my self-righteous anger. You know, self-righteous anger and so I, I actually just cornered two individuals and made them into the other. So, so my activism sort of evolved from basically what I say the broadness of my chest shouting in demonstrations charge to realizing I am being inconsistent and it's like there are many examples the book is full of stories where I confront the contradiction between what I am speaking about and what I am preaching and then the fact that I have not thought about what does that really mean in myself and when I started working on myself it's like literally my index finger one day is like oh god I have to do this then I, it took me to another journey and I'm gonna give very tangible example. For example, forgiveness, a value we all like, you know? Um, and I've seen many examples of forgiveness at a much larger scale in different countries um, and at the smaller scales. And I definitely had magnets in my refrigerators all about forgiveness and the home on cars about forgiveness <laughs> and all of these things. Because again, self-righteousness. There's a whole you know, industry You really feel, we wanna feel I am such a good person. But until, you know, honestly, a, a boyfriend I had broke my heart and I did not want to forgive him. I was angry, you know, so I was like, so what's the point about talking about forgiveness between enemies? All these magnets on my refrigerator about forgiveness and I can't forgive this one person, one person. I couldn't. I mean, I would say I forgave him, but at night I was like really brewing over it, you know, over what happened. So, you know, it's. We are, I was BSing myself, and I think a lot of us go through these things that we all want to say we are good, but we really, something inside us, we only us know, you know? Mm -hmm. Then the tool I had is like, someone asked me, well, can you forgive yourself? And to, well, I was like, because I didn't understand forgiveness. I understood the word, I didn't understand its meaning. So to forgive myself, for what? What have I done? I'm a good person. And then, I, I, like, it, it, was, it took a process of digging. And only you know that in yourself. And I learned that there's a part of me that actually, very insecure part of me, that had betrayed me. And, had, and, and that what I mean is the part of you that allows others to walk all over you. The part of you that knows something is wrong but you let it go because you wanna be loved and a nice person in the meeting room or in the coffee table or whatever. The part of you that compromise and sacrifice yourself just so you can get loved you know, and liked by your friends or loved ones. That's the, that's the part that betrays. And that part for me is a very insecure part. And it's a very vulnerable part. And when I was able to see her in me, it's, I felt bad for her. And I was able to forgive her because I realized it came from insecurity. Now, suddenly the meaning of forgiveness changed in its depth. Now it is not a magnet. Now it is forgiving also the insecure part of him that led to the hurts. And now when I talk about forgiving enemies, forgiving the other, political other, economic other, racial other, doesn't matter what's the other, is that it, I, I do it by seeing the insecurity in the other that causes the betrayal of 
me or people like me. And that becomes such an easy process because if I could forgive my insecurity, it's so easy for me to associate with the insecurity of the other and forgiveness and, and, and forgive them. And so my activism, to the core of how I identify myself, I am a humanitarian, a women's rights activist who have changed my method from charging with anger and doing about my activism from the broadness of my chest to actually doing my, understanding my activism inside. And when I lived in alignment, my act became out of the strength of my spine. And so it, when you implement these values in yourself, when I'm trying to get at, you become more humble of how hard they are to implement. And you become more compassionate to the other, even the demonized other, because you understand it is really hard to the implement these values, so you become more patient. So I still am an activist. I still want to change the world. I still want equality and justice, but I am not willing to do it with anger anymore. I can only do it with love, and love, if it lasts 100 years to do it, I'm willing to walk that 100 years rather than the 10 years of anger. It's so extraordinary to hear your leadership in action. Um, you live this principle, and I think it's powerful for me, and, and I would hope for each of us, to recognize that so much happens in the world and in the externality of what's happening, we forget that our lives are very much like the butterfly effect. The gentleness and the kindness and that forgiveness and that love that we experience in ourself when reflected with another actually has the capacity to change the lives of others and change the experiences of others. But it's also really interesting to see in your own humility, um, the power of that compassion also is not just a compassion for others, it's a compassion for self. And in doing great work and in helping others, could you share a little bit about how we sometimes come face to face with how we can contribute to others but how that can give way to the idea of being saviors rather than in fact being allies to the people and the circumstances that we encounter in this life. And you have such vivid examples of that. I'm gonna, I, may, I may have to ask your, exa uh, your, uh, your tip for which example you want me to use. <laughs> you, you, you know, one of the things you talked about was um, you know, this power of creating or imagining a future and building reality um, and how in fact in helping others we have to begin by not only helping yes. ourselves but yeah. in being responsible for ourselves, acknowledging and yes. recognizing our, our ability to support someone else doesn't diminish their greatness, but in fact, it's about having them be able to continue that step or that journey of their own greatness. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I have so many examples to give, but I, I will start with a couple, you know. Um, one is, as a woman of color, personally, myself, you know, and an, I'm an immigrant, a woman of color, a Muslim, like it's a... All the bads, but also the goods. It's like also a good space, honestly, to be a good time to be a woman of color who is, <laughs> you know, an immigrant. You know, you can do it on the bad side or on the good side. You know, but I mean, let's start with this. And the, you, but you do get a lot of projection, right? Um, on the one hand, I was like, "Don't save me. I'm okay. I need space." Sometimes I need holding of the space, especially in like if it's a, an alien place for me. I mean, I give a lot of speeches and one time I gave an enter speech and everyone was a man in suit. I was like, oh my God, that is intimidating, even though I'm a feminist and strong and I worked in war zones, but that's still an intimidating scene. So you don't need to, I didn't need a man to tell me that like, I'll say, I just need space to hold the space. Mm -hmm. And I would do it the same thing when I see someone else and not in their comfort position, right? You don't have to defend anyone, you just hold the space for them or give them space. It could be a shy person <laughs> in the meeting, you know? Give them space, you don't have to do anything more actually. But the other one also, the other projection you, you face is that people project things on you. For example, the most common question I get asked as a Muslim woman is when did you take your headscarf out off? And I'm like, it drives me crazy because I never wore it, nor has my mother, nor has my aunt. I mean, like, you know, I just grew up in a society where this was not the case, you know? 
zero judgment on anybody. I mean, like, you, you, it's, I grew up in a society where you accept all. You know, my cousin wear a headscarf, I don't wear a headscarf. It's not the end of, like, it's not a discussion, right? But the annoying, the reason it's annoying is because then I'm cornered into you're a Muslim, thus it must be this. And it's a, there is the annoyance is like, I'm a Muslim, thus my identity could be all over the spectrum in here, like all over the gamut, and like I don't need to be cornered into one um, identity. So I used to snap, you know, at the person who would ask me. And the snapping, by the way, this is my experience, you could have different experiences, whether you're a man or a woman, a person of color or not, or another gender, or whatever, it doesn't matter, right? Because you're so annoyed, why can't they see you? Right. And I realize in snapping at the person, I am becoming the boogie. I'm scaring them. I'm scaring the heck out of them, actually. You know, it's like, how, do, how dare you do the stereotyping, prejudice, da, 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 the whole thing, you know, like attack. And, and also as a Muslim, of course, the, you know, I, I tell, why do they, I tell them now I get asked, why do they hate us? You're all terrorists. I was like, oh, bad negative stereotype. No. It's annoying, but I realize when I snap, it's not doing anything. I am becoming a wall builder, build the wall, you know, rather than a demolishal of the wall. And so now of the wall. So now what I do is sort of, it's, but, but it's coming out of an understanding and a comfort out of in myself. It's saying, oh, you are afraid of this and this and this. You acknowledge the person's feeling first. That's my, my uh, steps. Acknowledge the person's feeling for where they are. In these feelings, by the way, from one to 10, maybe two or three, certain numbers may be accurate. Maybe exaggerated accurate, but accurate. It's coming from a place, not from nowhere, right? right. So are there terrorism in Islam? Of course, there are terrorism in Islam. Are there bad people? Of course they are. So acknowledge that the problem when it becomes 100% truth, which is not the case, right? So first I acknowledge. In acknowledging the other, immediately their walls go down. Immediately, because it's like, oh, you're not judging me. I'm seeing. Right, I'm seeing, it's like, it's like no. Then I acknowledge my I issue. Do you know I'm too afraid of you? <laughs> For example, by the way, it's true with all, you know, the fear is happening both sides, Absolutely. right? So I'm also afraid of you for your judgment and da da da, right? So then you're sharing, that's the constructive vulnerability. You're actually willingly sharing your feeling, but not out of weakness, out of strength. You know, that's the difference. It's out of awareness, what I'm saying. And then, then there's a dialogue now. Now that both lowered their walls, now we can, now I can talk about what it means to be a Muslim woman or an immigrant. And it's complex, and there's a debate between us, and we're not this or that. There's a heated debate between us also, and this is what. And suddenly, a conversation opens rather than a hostility. And again, I go to the point of we risk becoming what we are fighting against if we uh, are not conscious of our own actions and our values. A lot of people now talk about love, uh, you know, but. That love cannot just be a word, just like forgiveness cannot be a word. We need to understand how do we go about, as Gandhi says, be the change we want to implement in the world. It's just not an external one. It's a very internal one. And the internal one, by default, creates a different energy externally. So I don't know if I answered your question. but I have in many ways defining this idea that helping others begins with this real understanding not only of who we are and even in the quietness of nothing as you started with your first photograph to be able to enter a space where you surrender your technology and your connection to the world to grow connected to yourself to then emerge again and literally touch the world and touch all beings, whether it's the gorilla that we saw, or to be able to touch other cultures and to learn about them with that humility of there's something for each of us to, to gain and derive, both in our, our awareness of self and in reaching for another. But the, that very powerful core that you speak to around owning our vulnerability and owning our power at the same time because we often think that it's actually an act of, of giving our power away. I, I would add, if I may, it's also odd owning our shadow. Mm. It is impo we are all, I believe, good people. 
right? In this room, let's agree, at least we are good people. I think we I don't agree. know about outside <laughs> of the room, but this, you know, we are good people. Let's just, you know. And it's impossible for any of us to be only good person. We all have shadows in us. And the shadow is we have all hurt someone else. We have lied, we have done our own things that caused hurts, you know. If, and lately, because of the world we are in, we all want to be centered in the light. I am good, you are bad, right? And so we are then creating the polarity and the division. What I'm arguing is, and by the way, I was part of the polarity. As I said, I built a huge empire, part of that charge, until I realized, oh my God, I'm contributing to that, right? And so what I'm trying to say is that by on, on your light, you are, a, indeed, I am a good person. I really believe I'm a good person. <laughs> I think we agree with I you I think too. we all are, really. <laughs> But then once I saw that foundation, that there's goodness here, then you build, okay, where am I not good? This is simplified language, but where have I hurt each other? Other. Where have I, um, where have our people in my life have hurt others that I'm not been aware of or look the other direction? And confront that part. Now that part is not easy. It's actually hard. But if you own it, you own your life. Uh, because we are all are ashamed of aspects that of us, and we want to hide it. But these things that we want to hide come anyway. Come, it just uh, like it's like a, yeah, a horse that takes you to the south, and you don't have the leash on it. So what I'm saying is, put a leash on your horse, you know, on your dark horse and on your light horse. And because there's constructiveness in that, so own the shadow. I am an impact, and and by owning it. I control my life and I don't allow others to manipulate the part of my life that I want to dump under the rug because I'm too embarrassed of. Benign example, I'm impatient. It, you could, 10 years ago, in a meeting room, if you could tell me, if you tell me, Zainab, you're an impatient person, I would just be Def uh, defensive because I know I am. And then I go to the opposite, which I get become leeway and give leeway in everything. I would become too loose, right? But I am impatient and I go back into the same circle. Right now, just like, I know I'm impatient. I'm working on it. You can't manipulate that for me. You know, I'm owning it for myself, basically. There's power you know? in all of who we are the good and the bad. And the bad. The lightness and that darkness. And in that ownership, the space to actually create someone new, something new with another, and the compassion to grant it to others Precise. as well. Precisely. Really, really awesome, really powerful. So I've been asking the questions. I'm gonna invite our audience to contribute to this conversation. Certainly a great way to get to know Senab the way I have. So shall we begin? We've got a first. Thanks. Thank you both um, for spending time with us today and for your vulnerability, Zainab. I have a question about philanthropy because we have a pretty strong culture of giving here at LinkedIn, but personally, I sometimes feel like giving money is engaging with a cause at a distance. So I love your thoughts on how vulnerability and, and self-awareness can make us more impactful when we give money. Well, I love this question, more particularly because I designed a program at Women for Women International where the giving is not only money, it's also letter, letters where you share your stories and pictures. And so the, the core of Women for Women is to sponsor a woman by sending her $30 a month, one woman, one year uh, only. And the exchange is not only the $30 a month, but a, a communication from you. And I've witnessed thousands of women. She also writes... But in your letter, there is your story, and we are equal in our stories. You know, you may have money and she doesn't, but in the stories, as humans, yes, you live, you have perhaps more privilege or not, but the, the emotions of loss and love and good, and bad, they're all the same. They are universal emotions. And so I always say share the story also in the giving. Now, in this example, it's a, another woman in a different part of the world. You can actually do it in this country as well. It's sort of, is show up, you know, show up in the context, you know. Um, 
where you are not only going and send, writing a check, but you are showing up in sh telling the person who you are, telling your story, um, being involved directly, looking the, at them in their eyes. These things, I think, in a time where we need more authenticity, we need that. However, showing up means to you. There is no judgment, I think. But I think that's what we need. I mean, to, you know, um, not related, but I was in Mecca a few years ago, uh, the Muslim um, pilgrimage, right? And there you see millions of women and men, you know, going around. I'm sure you've seen it on TV. Unbelievable experience. And um, and you see all kinds of people from different colors, you know, every, every nationality is there. And also some people look scary and some people look cool, you know, but I mean like not scary, but I mean like you see everyone. And few days later, I, I dreamt and I was in the dream. I was like, God, were you there? Because in Islam, this is the house of God, right? And everyone is going around um, to greet God. And whether this is true or not, but I like the answer. The dream said, no, this is not about me. It's about all of you coming in one place so you may see each other. And I think the way we do philanthropy is we need to see each other. Um, because in seeing each other, we realize there's a oneness even of the scary people. There's also a oneness in that, and we dismantle the, the, our fear of them and their fear of us. Zainab, I think you've just, in many ways, embodied another definition for something we call the plus one pledge here at LinkedIn. Um, the ability to see another and contribute to them in such a way that they have the ability to you know, attain opportunities that wouldn't have been available to them otherwise. But I think you described one of the most powerful elements of the plus one pledge which is we're not giving something to another. We're opening the doorway to exchange and learn from others who come from different experiences or different backgrounds. And the currency for that exchange may be our talent. It may come in our philanthropic contributions. It may be in how we mentor um, another individual. But what's really important is that it's seeing someone and as a result of seeing them, validating them in the world and giving them an opportunity to Beautiful. make a difference. I mean, in my way, I say, Build a bridge. Build a bridge with the other person. Now, that bridge may be destroyed, may be not sustainable, may fall apart. Build another bridge. You know, build another bridge until so many people are part of building that bridge. It cannot be destroyed, you know, and that's our goal, in my opinion, in our life today. So such a scary part of life is being the bridge builder, and that's something that you've evolved to. You know, you talk about the early stages of activism being in the fight. And we talked a little bit about the power of language and how sometimes we use language and the very language we use to evoke the bridge tears down the bridge. Yes. Could you share a little bit about that? I think I, I mean, I don't know what else to share, you know, except in my, how I, my, in my activism, I would just point the finger. And I see it a lot these days, by the way, you know, in, in, in both spectrum of our, Society. Of society, you know, I see it a lot, and and I, you know, I, I, I happen to be in the. I, I when people say where are you from, I say I am from the people of the bridge. I live in the bridge. <laughs> it's the safest place to be, actually. <laughs> also, it's really nice because no rules applies to you, you know, you know, in the bridge. But, but the point is, I could see how people become scared of each other, you know, um, and dehumanize each other in the process. So I learned it because I was on both sides of the bridge. I was the dehumanized and the dehumanizer. Um, one part of my life I was the dehumanized and the other part of the, my life was the dehumanizer. And I'm hoping I'm starting a decade of integration, you know. Um, but I learned it the hard way when I'm trying to say. And it's interesting for me, I, I'm someone who's dedicated to marginalized, uh, to representing marginalized voices. and. You know, at the beginning, it was only women and only the poor. And I actually think marginalized voices right now has no class uh, issue. Sometimes marginalized voices could be um, affluent person, but that, but, but we're, we're putting so much projection on them. So it has nothing to do with class or gender um, as much as 
where are we uh, scaring people and where are we opening the doors? It's really interesting discussion. to think that on the other side of the bridge is always something that scares us. So building the bridge is to actually override the fear, not even confront fear, but yes. how do we overcome fear? Well, when, I, when you look at fear in the eyes, you can go in the other direction of it. I mean, that has been my experience of how you do it. I give sort of the steps and try to suggest steps to like, how do you go about uh, looking at fear in the eyes? But what I, every time I avoided it, I learned it's not worth it. It's easier and faster to go through fears in the eyes and get out of it than to be scared of it. Yeah, my experience is each time I confront fear or it comes up, if I don't deal with it then, the next time it comes up, it's bigger and worse than That's the last time. And it's, it's always so like a recurring theme. Hi there. Hi, thank you so much for your time today. Um, my question is, do you have any advice for parents um, in brokering these conversations about building bridges and recognizing others while still helping them develop healthy boundaries for themselves? That's a very, very good, I mean, I, you know, it's so interesting because we are in such a divided world right now and I have a lot of, um, you know, the complaint, the, the grievance I'm hearing from some of my Caucasian friends is actually of their kids being sort of having issues with being white themselves, you know, and it's like, oh, it's bad, you know, and I'm, you know, as not as a foreigner, I mean, I'm, I'm an American, but still an immigrant, it's like, that's not the way we should uh, go about the conversation is how do we go about the conversation with um, seeing the other, respecting the other, but that doesn't mean you see yourself down and, and torture yourself in the process. Um, I'm not a parent myself, so it would be a, um, fake for me to tell you what uh, to advise. Um, as much as we should not, I mean, I also see a lot of friends who are torturing their kids based on whether it's as a result of the Me Too movement or as a result of race tension or class tension in this country, they're putting it all on their kids, the barriers on their kids, and the kids are feeling that. And how do you navigate that where you do not project it on your child and you do not put the burden on the child to carry that burden that is society's talking about is a task, but it's a task that is, can be done in my opinion. So I'm not answering you directly because um, I think it's a, it's a longer conversation, I think, yeah. It's a beautiful conversation to think about. I have a nine-year-old son and I always think about that power of projection. Like how do you raise a human being and empower them to be themselves without projecting the facades that society creates for us. It's like masks that you're forced to, to wear, even if that's not who you are. But I love how you talk about not only meeting people where they are, but in many ways really opening up to embrace them. Yes. You know, and embracing their light and their darkness, recognizing that none of us is any one thing. That power of the many identities we carry is such a beautiful way of even being able to look at how our children grow. In some cases, they're testing on new identities, but which one actually sticks is a function, I think, of how much love they're given and encouragement to just be loved and, and give that love back That's to brilliant. others. That's brilliant. One of my favorite books is called Identity and Violence. It's actually 20 years old by Amartya Sen. But he basically argues that when you corner someone and only tell them you are this, you know, based on one identity that you see and you exclude the multiplicity of their identity, that person becomes what you're telling, like, you know, because you're actually oppressing them in taking all their identities out. And so for me is that that can be done also to ourselves, you know, to the kids. If you tell them don't do it, you know, it's like, how do you, like we have to hold the space for each other to see the multiplicity of our identities. And it makes me personally more compassionate when, when I was able to see the goodness and the badness in me and still love me, I was able to see the goodness and the badness in others and still love them. You know how you break up with friends because they did something? Blah, blah, blah. I now see a friend or see someone in my life and say, well, this is their goodness and this is their shadow. Can I hold, can I love them still with their shadow? 
whatever it may be, by the way, we all, you know, and it makes, as opposed to, oh, I see their shadow, I'm never becoming their friends, you know, which then you, by the way, you cut off yourself from a lot of people, you know. Yeah. So it's sort of the same thing with our families and our children and, uh, and ourselves, you know, we hold ourselves with that collectiveness as opposed to only wanting to see the goodness. I love that term, holding the space. You know, as human beings, we often don't grant space and we jump to conclusions about ourselves and others, holding that space is almost like the pause before the determination. That's all that we need. I mean, as a person of color and a minority and all of that, that's all what I ask of people. Do not, I do not need saving. I just need holding the space when I need it. How powerful, how beautiful. Great, thank you. Well, it looks like we are beginning to wrap up. A couple of things that I'd like to ask you before we close up, Zainab. As human beings walking this human experience in life, in a time of turbulence and divide, what would you advise us to not only do, but who would you advise us to look to be so that we can have a possibility of making a difference in this world? Well, I'm going to ask you a question by a story, which I was... Um, in Mosul, in um, ISIS, you, know, you remember Mosul in ISIS territories, and I was there two weeks after ISIS was overthrown, uh, which means people are still like uh, shocked of the experience. I'm just walking in the street and I'm like encountering all kinds of people, garbage collectors, women, men, policemen, teachers, everyone. And the one word that they were all saying all of them. They're saying, we need a new human being. Mm -hmm. We need a new value system because we bought into all the other values that we were told to embrace and each one of them failed us. And then they have their particular examples of how they bought into their own stories of values. I think we have our own particular examples of how we bought into historical stories of values, but we implement them with that sort of um, when, when I'm trying to say is that if you implement these values based on power and strength, which were the people of Mosul saying, each group of people told us, if you do this, we'll give you power and strength, and we would do this. And then we would have first to kill this group of people, and then this group of people, until the killing and the oppression became of our own selves. And we end up becoming the nuclear bomb on ourselves. That's their words, not mine. They are like, no one bombed us this time. We became the nuclear bomb because we embrace so many promises that gives us strength and power and we failed ourselves. And so the question for me, this is there, I give severe examples unfortunately for me because just my life has severe examples. Like knowing Saddam Hussein is just a severe example. It gets in the way of the intense. story. It gets in the way of the story. I wish he was someone else, you know. But I mean, but, but the point is look at your own examples in your own life and what values have you embraced as sort of whether it is because of success or acquisitions of money or power or positions or whatever that it became the nuclear bomb in your life and and sort of lost you in the process of accomplishing that external uh, accomplishments and I think what we need to do all of us is find these values you know like find ourselves back again and align ourselves in a way that it will change our life. It shall change our life, and yet that change is a healthy change. In other words, I mean, I started with the gorilla story with the picture, and there's so much discussion of climate change and Earth. Well, we're gonna have to change the way of being as humans in order to change Earth. It's not about changing policies, it's we need to consume less, we need to act differently, right? It's just basic, we can't continue to do what we are doing right now and still think we are good citizens in saving Earth. We're not. So we have to change that. That change is necessary for us and for the larger picture. It may be different. It's out of trend. You're not out of trend. It's not in trend yet. Right. But you have to create your own trend in your own life to become in alignment with who you are and your values. It's hard, but it's worth it. I call it the taste of freedom of living your own authentic life. It's so delicious. I almost said so effing delicious that it is worth the hard journey 
it takes for each individual to make. Thank you for granting us this powerful space to know that freedom is an inside job. I ask each of you to join me in thanking you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We look Thank forward you. to seeing you at a future Lincoln Speaker Series. Thanks for joining us today.